soon, we're going to go through kind of the process of what needs to happen in order for evolution to act on a population. And specifically, what we're going to focus on is the genetic variance component of that requirement of evolution. So let's go ahead and dive in. So when we're thinking about evolution, you have seen this definition before. Again, it's the change in the genetic variance of a population over time. So let's actually break down this definition and you can kind of see what we need in order for evolution to happen. So there's three general requirements. First, there's got to be variance in the population. Variance can uh, occur in tons of different ways. A lot of the variants people think of are physical characteristics. So with humans, you might think of hair color, eye color, how tall you are. Uh, you could even think about things that are more mental. So thinking about say IQ or mental capacity for different things. But variants can also be at the molecular level. So how efficient different enzymes are or um, how the body is processing um, different things or reacting to different stimuli. So variants can occur in a lot of different things. So if evolution is going to act on a population, there has to be variation in something. What that something is really depends on the population and the environment. Now, whatever that variance is, if evolution is going to happen, that variance has to be inherited. Or you could say it has to have a genetic component. This should hopefully make sense to you because, sure, humans have uh, a variation in hair length, but hair length isn't a genetic trait, right? I can use scissors and cut my hair. Now, there is some part of it that is uh, genetic because if you think about um, strength of hair or whatever, but for the most part, if you think about hair length, sure, there's variation in our population, but it's not a genetic trait. If you looked at tattoos on humans, sure, that's variation, but it's not genetic. So if evolution is going to happen, it has to be on something that has a genetic component. And then finally, there has to be some mechanism of change. How does that genetic variance change? Just to give you some examples that we're going to dive more into, a mechanism of change could be natural selection. It could be something like gene flow or artificial selection. We're going to explore those more later. What we're going to focus on in this video is the genetic variance part. So I'm combining in red the first and second requirements. So we have variance with a genetic component. Now, let's be a little bit more specific. Uh, what, how do we, I guess, determine what variance is? So the variation we're looking at is essentially the diversity that exists in different types of alleles and phenotypes. And if you don't remember those words from previous classes, remember an allele is a variation of a gene and a phenotype is the expression of that gene. So going to a super simple example, so uh, we might be looking at a gene that is big B, little b. Remember for every gene, uh, you have two alleles. One allele is from one of the chromosomes, the chromosome that came from your mom, and one of the alleles is from your second chromosome that came from your dad. In this very basic example, I'm saying one allele is big B and the other allele is little b. Let's say this is for uh, eye color. Big B is representing a brown variant. Little b is representing a blue variant. This is not a genetics class, but you might remember, oh, well, if this is dominant, then the whole expression would be brown because there is a dominant, uh, dominant allele present. So the allele would be big B. The allele would be little b. The phenotype would be the physical expression. So in this case, it'd be brown hair or blue eyes or a ability to break down lactose. It can, it can be a lot of different things. So when we say variance, what we're meaning is a variety of these phenotypes and of the alleles. Just in general, especially as we move more through this unit, typically having more genetic variants or higher genetic vari variants in a population is good. The more variation that exists, the higher likelihood that population will survive. Because if a new predator comes in, if the food supply changes, if weather conditions change, if there's a whole bunch of variation, 
that means that some individuals are likely to survive. They have some combination of traits that enable them to survive. But if your population is very similar to one another, if, if similar to the potato famine uh, in Ireland, if all of your potatoes are clones of one another, if something happens, if a disease comes through, if a parasite comes through, and they're all the same, you have a much higher likelihood of extinction, uh, whether that's locally or globally. There's also issues with inbreeding as well. So if there's not a lot of variation and you're breeding with one another, inbreeding can cause some serious um, defects due to uh, an increased risk of disease. We're not gonna explore that too much in this class, but just kind of connotate lower genetic variants with not as great for the survival of that population. So we're gonna explore um, how a population, I guess, gets genetic variants. How do we get this genetic component and how do we change this genetic component? And there's only two ways. The first way is through mutation. Mutations are the only source, only source of new alleles in a population. And so by new alleles, if we go back to our big B, little b example, big B was our brown hair, little b was our blonde hair, and maybe there was a mutation uh, in the DNA that causes red hair or orange hair or yellow hair, whatever you wanna go with. So it's only through mutation that we get brand new alleles in a population. As a recap as to what mutations are, so these randomly occur during DNA replication. Remember, DNA replication happens anytime we make new cells. So when your skin cell undergoes mitosis, so it duplicates itself, it's also duplicating the DNA. And sometimes there's errors when DNA duplicates. It is not a perfect system. There's a lot of different mutations. This picture is just showing you one type of mutation. It doesn't really matter the different types in this course. Just know that they randomly occur. It's not on purpose. And uh, and this is the only way something new might occur in that individual and introducing that into the population. Now, what that mutation looks like really depends. And, and you may have learned this in your previous classes. So you can classify our mutations into three different categories. Beneficial mutations, deleterious, and neutral. And what we mean by these is taking a look at them at the phenotype level. So sure, something happened in your DNA. Well, did something happen that we can actually see that actually gets expressed? So let me give you a couple examples. So here we have a tree frog. This tree frog has a mutation that caused its skin pigment to essentially not be made. So it's an albino frog. This would be an example of a deleterious mutation. Deleterious essentially means bad, a bad mutation, a mutation that will probably get deleted from that population. And that's because this mutation has now caused this frog to stick out. And because this frog stick out, it's more likely to get predated upon, more likely to um, get predated upon pretty early on in its life before it even gets a chance to reproduce and pass on that gene. You might have a mutation that's beneficial, such as the opposable thumbs that we see in humans. With our opposable thumb, <coughs> excuse me, with our opposable thumb, we can use things like tools, and tools are able to uh, allow us to, one, escape from uh, predation and threats, but also enables us to get more food, as well as a lot of other uh, benefits. So in this case, this mutation actually had a benefit for us. And because it benefited us, those that had this mutation survived longer, reproduced more, and passed it on to offspring. Whereas those who didn't have it didn't have that benefit. And then finally, you have things like neutral mutations. So our earlobes, you can, you can feel your earlobes kind of have this scale of, of free or dangly earlobes, and some people have more attached earlobes. It may have been mutations, because I'm using this just as an example, it may have been mutations that kind of dictated how dangly or how attached your earlobes were, but it's not helping you to survive. It's also not 
literally not killing you either. Whether you have a dangly or an attached earlobe, okay, sure, it was a mutation, but it's not helping me reproduce more. It's not hurting my chances of survival. So we refer to those as neutral mutations. Now you may have used similar words before with mutations, but you were looking at it at the molecular scale. Beneficial, deleterious, and neutral are referring to mutations at the physical scale. How do they actually manifest in that organism? So this is one way we get genetic variants, is the presence of mutations um, during that DNA replication. The second way we get genetic variants is very simply sexual reproduction. In sexual reproduction in all organisms, we're not talking about just animals, plants, fungi, bacteria, these all undergo sexual reproduction. You have two parents or two individuals that come together one way or another, and the DNA from one individual and the DNA from the other individual come together and, to be super simple, mix up to create their offspring. And so what happens is no, there's no new alleles like we see with mutations, but what we start seeing is new combinations of alleles. This is actually how a mutation might spread in a population. If one parent, say mom, has a, a new mutation, maybe it helped her to survive, and she reproduces, sexually reproduces with another organism, she may pass that mutation on to her offspring. So sexual reproduction is really the only way to mix alleles up. If you are only reproducing with one type of organism, they all have the same shell color or um, the same diet or what have you, eh, there's not many alleles to mix up. But as individuals reproduce in different areas with different types of organisms, with different colors, with different whatever, that mix of alleles is gonna create offspring that have potentially different phenotypes and different survivability in that uh, population. So with that, again, what we're looking at is what we need for evolution to happen. There has to be variance in something. Whatever that variation is needs to have a genetic component. And there has to be a mechanism of change. The only way that we can introduce genetic variants into a population is through mutations and through sexual reproduction. Our next set of videos are going to explore more that mechanism of change that can then change or act on that genetic variance.